Here is my RS6 GT3. And here is my RS6 engine. Oh my. The engine decided to seize after I put the wrong octane fuel in it, which caused this a gaping hole in the cylinder. So now I'm over 4,000 miles away from home with a broken engine that we need to fix. And today, my look's about to get even worse. Oh, I can't believe it. Can't believe it. Yeah. This would have been so good. Everything's dead. You killed it. Good. <laughs> Problem number one. This hole in this cylinder block here means that, well, this is not salvageable. We're going to need a new block. And finding a new block is next to impossible. So effectively, we need a new engine. This model of RS6 isn't available in the US. So it makes it impossible to find an engine for one over here. The thing is, I know that this engine is not only used in the RS6, it's used in the S6, the RS7, the Lamborghini Urus, and the Bentley Continental GT. The cheapest option, even though I think they're all the same, was one I found for an RS7. So I bought the second hand engine, then had it delivered to Freddy's unit. Say hello to my brand new second hand Audi RS7 engine, which supposedly only has 28,000 miles on the clock. And from first looks of things, it does look exactly the same. But I guess we'll find out when we put this engine inside the car. And if it doesn't work, we've got to make it work. Before we start putting the new engine in the car, there's a few things we've got to change over first. Starting with the alternator off the old engine. This is the first alternator that I've seen, which is called by coolant. Oh! <laughs> yes. That's gotta be the heaviest alternator in the world. <laughs> now I've got the alternator off, I can start to fit it onto the new RS7 engine. I really hope that this engine is gonna work in the RS6. I've just gotta pull the tensioner down so I can get the belt on. If you had to do that with the engine in, God help you. Then next up, we're trying to remove the engine and the gearbox away from the subframe. I'm going to undo this bolt here, which is the engine mount bolt, which is the only thing connecting the subframe to the engine. Once I've undone this bolt on both sides, we should be able to lift the engine and gearbox away from the subframe. And that's exactly what we've done. So now we have the old engine and gearbox standing on the crane, the subframe on the floor, which I'm preparing to go onto the RS7 engine and the RS6 looking sorry for itself over there. So Magic Gearbox has a torque converter on it. Right, well you have to disconnect the torque converter from the flywheel, otherwise you just dump the oil all over the floor. There's usually a little access hole underneath the gearbox where you can get to the bolts for the torque converter. One? Bolt. You then have to keep turning the gearbox to get to every bolt on the torque converter. And once all those bolts are removed, you can start removing the bell housing bolts, which connect the gearbox to the engine. There's quite a lot of these bolts, and to do it in the car, it would have been next to impossible. We've got to take the starter motor off. But to get the starter motor off, you've got to take an engine mount off. This engine was definitely 100% not made to be worked on. The last thing holding it in is, of course, the starter motor. This engine mount bracket has got to be pulled out of the way, and then we can just get to the two bolts holding the starter motor on. Will the gear... Oh! Oh! <laughs> yeah, you pull that. Watch this. Yes! Look at this absolute weapon. So, huge gearbox, torque converter in there, not a clutch. You ever wonder why RS6s are so heavy? Look at this big elephant of a gearbox. <laughs> and that should be it. Now all I've got to do is bolt the old gearbox to the new RS7 engine and then bolt it all to the subframe. Then we found a huge issue. I have fully messed up. And it's a good job we've noticed now. So you know how this is a left-hand drive Audi RS7 engine and, oh, this is a right-hand drive. You wouldn't think it'd be any different, but we've noticed something that's different already and it is, it is, it's not good. This wire in here on the left-hand drive, if you come over, on the right-hand drive car, all the, the fuse box sits here, the ECU sits here and 
the air box and everything for the blowers all sit on the right hand side of the car over here. Now on the left hand drive car, all this is over here. So the ECU and all the fuse box is over here, which means on a left hand drive car, all this wiring is shorter because it only got to go to that side of the car. Whereas on the right hand drive car, <laughs> look how much longer this, this is. It is insanely, like it's way longer so it can reach all the way around the back of the engine and go there. Like, all night we've been thinking, what are we gonna do with this? Because it sounds easy just to unplug all of these plugs, every single plug on here and take it off. And it's not easy. It's, it's gonna be a very long job to unplug the whole wiring harness and then put it onto that. I can't, I can't believe I didn't think of this before. We gotta start unplugging every single wire on that and take it off and then unplug every single wire on this. <laughs> Switch it off. This is not good. <laughs> At this point, I'm beginning to think it would have been a better idea to send the car home to repair it. But I spent so much time and effort rebuilding this car and then sending it over to the US for it just to give up on its first drive. I can't give up now. I'm determined to get this fixed. We finally got off the four engine wiring loom off the right hand drive engine and then it was time to move over onto the left hand drive RS7 engine and remove all the wires off that. Now remember, when we start installing all the wires back on this, if we miss one single plug off, it could be the case of taking the whole engine back out to plug it back in. If you notice on this clip, I've actually taken off the inlet manifold just so I can unplug the injectors. Big moment. So we can't mess this up. Go on. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. So, so. The shorter wiring harness is off. Technically, a left-hand drive RS6 is lighter than a right-hand drive RS6, even though you can't even get them in this. Oh yeah, you can get left-hand drive RS6s, I think. Look at this. All we've got to do now is get all of this monstrosity onto there. Apparently, the stock spark plugs are prone, especially on tuned engines, to break that tip off, which is what happened to mine. So, we're not taking any risks. Bought some uprated NGK plugs, and we're going to put these in instead, because if you think we've learned from a lesson on not having the car tuned, then you'd be wrong, because straight after this, potentially it could be being tuned. <laughs> yeah. That's right, we're gonna need the car tuned again, but this time over in Florida, just so it can cope with the US fuel, or else we're gonna end up with a repeat of last time. And these new Iridium spark plugs should be up for the test. Now, it's time for the wiring. I dread to think how long this is gonna take. Come on! On this engine, there is sensors everywhere, and we cannot afford to miss one single plug off. I started plugging in the stuff from the top, then moving down onto the inlet manifold. The wiring routes in such a way that if you get it wrong, then one plug won't reach where it's meant to go to, so you've got to get it perfect. And once most of the wiring's on, I can start putting on the aircon lines. A lot of stuff has to be put on at this point because it's really difficult to get to once it's in the car. Once that's all sorted, we're off to get the front subframe and then slide it underneath the engine so we could lower the engine onto the subframe. We're trying to get this bolt on the engine mounting to line up to the engine mounting bracket on the side of the engine. That way we can slot the bolt in and the engine will be secured to the front subframe. Next up, the elephant of a gearbox. The torque converter little knob here has got to slide into this hole in the flywheel. And this gearbox is really heavy to pull up to it. Again, another vital step that we've got to get lined up perfect. And once we did, we can tighten all the bell housing bolts to pull the gearbox to the engine. Then my dad's gonna put in the front drive shafts to the side of the gearbox, whilst I'm at the back of the engine installing the downpipes. And there's one final thing that I wanted to check before we go putting this engine and gearbox in the car. And to do so, I'm going to have to call Audi themselves. Your call is being recorded for quality purposes. 
Thank you for calling Audi North Orlando, where we're celebrating the season of Audi sales event. How many is this you today? Hello, um, I've got an Audi RS7 here, and uh, I believe the RS7 had a recall at some point. And I'm just wondering whether, um, if I give you the VIN number, you'll be able to see whether the uh, Audis had the recall um, on this filter, if, if that's possible. I'm trying to work out whether the oil gauze in the turbo oil feed has been changed. This was a recall on all the RS6 engines, which we didn't manage to get done on ours. And last thing I want to do is put this engine in without doing the job, because it'd be much easier to do with the engine out. I would only be able to see if there's an active recall. Yeah, that would be, that'd be perfect. That would be perfect. I wouldn't be able to see. Okay, can you yeah. give me just a moment? There are no current open recalls on this RS7. Um, it looks like back in, it looks like every recall is currently closed on this vehicle, so there are no open recalls. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. That's amazing. You're welcome. Cheers. Absolutely. Have a Bye. wonderful day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so, according to Orlando, Florida, the recall's been done. Do we trust it? I don't know. It is a lot of work getting it off, but the chances are it could have had the recall because it was a long time ago. I think we risk it. Everyone said, I know, <laughs> everyone, everyone is saying don't risk it, but I think we risk it. If it's had the recall, it would have said outstanding, re it would have said outstanding recall. As long as you keep the oil fresh, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So we're just going to send it and start putting the engine back in. Big moment it's going in. Which means pushing the engine and gearbox on a pallet truck underneath the car and then lowering the car down onto the subframe. And you can see how tight the gap is here. And I know a lot of you would have loved an engine conversion on this car, but there's barely enough room for the stock one. And if you're going to do an engine conversion, it's got to be for a bigger engine, right? Once we got the car lowered down, we could then start putting in the bolts for the subframe. These bolts are going to hold everything up so we can hire the car up in the ramp and then connect the steering column to the steering rack, as you can see my dad's doing here. Freddy's back. Hello. <laughs> and uh, not that he's got anything else going on or anything like that. He decided to help us with this. So Freddy's going to be attacking the oil cooler because, uh, well, I'll let Freddy explain. Well, the reason why you want to take out the oil cooler is because the engine uh, exploded. Yeah, it was very bad. Yeah, and uh, when that happens, a lot of metal goes where it shouldn't go, uh, and usually into the oil. So you want to make sure that uh, all the oil passages and stuff are clean of all those... Uh, well, it's like, it's like glitter. It's like stripper glitter. Yeah. 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 I mean, it went, it, it went to Vegas, you know, came, yeah. back, came back with some glitter and uh, an STD. So, uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Freddie's right, any debris in the oil, which could be contained in the oil cooler, could end up working its way back through into the new engine. So Freddie's took the cooler outside and he's pressure washing it through. And then he's gonna use some compressed air to push out any remaining water. It, it, there's a saying in America, uh, this is good enough for who it's for. <laughs> we think it is sensible now, being that we think the fuel was the problem on the last engine, to get all of this very bad fuel out. And the way we're going to do that, put the ignition on and the fuel pump will prime and we're just going to let it come out. And if that doesn't work, then we're hopefully going to put power to the fuel relay, which we can't find. Oh, it's squirting. Still, still got it. When you turn the ignition on, it only primes the fuel pump for a few seconds. So we need to find the fuel relay so we can send power directly to it. And the way we was doing that was just by removing relays and putting the ignition on to see if the fuel right pump would prime. And when it didn't, we know we found the right one. Nope. Nothing. No, we found the relay one. So it's that is the relay. This one here. Plan now, put power directly to the relay. And the way we were gonna do that was with a power probe. This will send 12 volts directly through where the relay should have been to hopefully prime the pump permanently. Hell yeah. Oh no. But again, it only did it for a few seconds before it cut out. And this would take ages to clear out a full tank of fuel. So we needed another solution. ECU disconnected. Can we get a consistent flow of fuel? Action. We thought maybe the ECU was stopping Ooh. it priming consistently, but it wasn't. So we had to move to plan B. I went to the back of the car to the filling cap to see if we could siphon out the fuel that way, but there was a valve in it which stopped you. So then I moved inside. If you can put power, 
<laughs> to the low pressure fuel pump, it should get us a consistent flow of fuel because at the minute we're trying to put power to the fuel relay and it's only giving us power for like two seconds at a time and it's going to take us ages to drain a full tank. So let's take a look. There she is. We need to find out which one we put power to. I took the connector off and my dad turned the ignition on. Then I was trying to figure out which one of the wires was the 12 volt wire sending power to the low pressure fuel pump. But I couldn't find any of them that were 12 volt and I didn't want to risk sending power to the wrong one and blowing something out. So plan C arised. Which was to knock the fuel filter off and just siphon it out of the tank that way. <laughs> oh, oh, my. oh my god. Oh my god. It's going oh, crazy man. around here. This workshop is highly flammable. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you can catch it in one bucket. <laughs> We're going to need two buckets. <laughs> is it really that bad? <laughs> it, 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 it's quite bad. We left a lot of the fuel to drain out, but once it had lowered down into the tank, we had to siphon out the rest. So my dad got a pipe, filled it up with fuel, and then popped it into the fuel tank, which is behind the front seats. After that, it can release one end and it should start siphoning out the rest of the fuel. And whilst I was waiting for all the fuel to come out, I decided to put on the brake calipers. You don't know how much I can miss your touch. Time for all the fluid now. We're this close to starting it and Matt wanted... Matt wanted to do some work and he's already... Oh, I've already broke He's already broke already something. Broken. He's taken <laughs> off the oil filter just up here oh, oh it's no, good. good okay oh, I should have walked up. <laughs> change the oil filter that's it just pull it out pull it out <laughs> <laughs> got a click oh, yeah, yeah made a click noise. right go on in we go matt continued to fit the oil filter and once that was fitted we can add oil 8.7 litres to go in this is where we're going to find out whether we've done everything up because it could be oil on the floor. You may notice with the Valvoline backdrop and the Valvoline oil that we're now partners with Valvoline, which is great. Next step, fuel, baby. And we want that good, 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 good stuff. <laughs> hey. Do you know what? All of this talk of fluid. It's getting me hungry and thirsty. Did you bring a Y food? That would be a really good idea actually because Y food would not only clench my thirst, it would also clench my hunger because it's a meal replacement drink. But unfortunately, I left my Y food at home, which would have been so good right now because it's high in protein, it's high in fiber, it's lactose free, it's gluten free, and there's no added sugar, just like this fuel. Don't drink fuel. <laughs> now Y food isn't a diet drink, it isn't a protein shake, it simply replaces one meal throughout the day. And there's loads of different flavours to choose from. Here's my dad's favourite. Happy banana. Is that because you're a happy guy? Yeah. <laughs> and Y food can be for everyone. Because they do vegan options. And not only that, the Y food bottle is 100% recyclable. So you are, in fact, not, da not harming the earth. Unlike my... V8. <laughs> so if you're constantly on the go, like myself, and find yourself just grabbing fast food at lunch, why not try Y Food? Now, Y Food have an exclusive sale on at the minute, and it's only going to last for three days, and it's 20% off. So if you want to try Y Food for yourself, if you're thinking about being healthier for the new year, you can do with the link in the description. Go and find it, your favorite flavor, and there's a discount code in there. But it only lasts for three days, 20% off. Go and get yourself a Y Food and tell me you didn't like it. The last bits to fit up to the car now before we can start it. The front radiator pack, which has the intercooler and the coolant rad on. And then we're gonna connect up as many electrical connections as possible to avoid it throwing any codes when we start it. Next up, it's the coolant. Again, Valvoline coolant. And we're just checking underneath to see if there's any leaks, but all is looking good. And I think we're ready for the first start of the RS7 engine. There's no exhaust on it, so it's going to be loud. There's no prop shaft on it, so we've not got no power to the back wheels. But we should have enough on now to see whether an RS7 engine works in an Audi RS6. 
with different wiring loom. If we've left one thing unplugged now, I don't, I actually don't know what we're gonna do. Okay, let's do it. This was the big moment. Will it work? No. He stabbed the brake and then hit the, hit the start. But it didn't seem to be turning over. Okay, maybe we need to put the code code reader in and clear the codes. Because if it if the starter motor turned last time and it was seized, maybe there's some kind of safety thing stopping it. I know there's a pyrofuse underneath the dash. Oh. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. That definitely sounds like it. Yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> so I was thinking that if we connect the code reader and scan the codes and clear them all off, we should then be able to start the car because it wouldn't think that there's anything wrong with it. I also went underneath to check all the connections going to the gearbox, the starter, and anything else that was needed to start the car. I then also checked the fuses for the starter as well, and all was good. What? It's literally just a loose wire. But my dad found Sorry. one loose wire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Oh, now you remember. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. It's quieter than that guy. Oh. <laughs> is it still not going? Is it it's, it, 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 did, it says on here, start an engine. Everything's happy in here. It's just not happy out of there. Surely the starter motor hasn't gone. Although it could have because we tried to start the car when the engine was seized. So we're going to scan for codes again. Starter does not turn. Mechanically blocked or electrical malfunction. Two things we can do. Uh, one is we can try to get a wire in here and then measure that you're actually getting voltage, where you should be getting voltage. And if you're not, then that means that it's maybe a fuse somewhere or whatever. Uh, and the second part is uh, we'd have to take the engine out to, to get, <laughs> like, and I'm, not, I, I'm a little bit joking, but like like 90% not joking because it might it might be that. I double checked to make sure that all the connections were on the starter motor. What's happened? I think the plug's on. Which is not good news. No. Then Freddy tried the good old fashioned tap the starter motor, see if it knocks it into life. What? No. But it didn't work. The wire from the starter is this separate loom. So what we're going to do is we're going to feed power from the top of the engine down to the starter motor and if the starter motor engages then we know it's something if other else but if it doesn't it's fault starter motor. So the power probe is coming in use again. We're going to send 12 volts directly to the starter motor solenoid. Let's see if we can hear it engage. But we heard nothing. So it could actually be that the starter motor has gone, which is not good news at all. Now we know that that, that what we could do is check, see whether this is getting power power. Yeah. When you t push the key. Yeah. Yep. It's getting yeah. It's getting starter signal. It's it's down starter there. It's yeah. The so starter. it's not a fuse or anything. So it's getting it's getting signal to the solenoid. Solenoid's not doing anything. Gone. You know what, I like Florida, but I, I would like it to be able to drive around Florida in my own car. And the worst thing about it, the starter motor isn't easy to get to to change. The starter motor is here. What it does, it engages the teeth and spins the engine round. This, there is, there's one <laughs> bolt which goes that way and another bolt which goes where? Goes that way. Here. And now into the gearbox, it comes at the bottom here. Right, and goes into, into the, the gearbox. gearbox. These two bolts are going to be hot, one hard to get to. The second thing, the starter motor is about yay big. So to get it out, past an engine mount is there, is going to be another challenge. Another challenge after that is getting a starter motor to replace it. So we took a trip over to Lake County Euros. The only place I know in Florida that works on European cars other than Audi and was going to see if he had a starter motor in stock and what's the actual book time on replacing one. Starter motor 
assembly. Oh, nine and a half hours. Nine, nine and a half. Is that with the engine already out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, manual. Here you go, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we didn't book it in, but uh, instead we got the manual to do it ourselves. <laughs> Yay. So now we're on a race against time. Audi's book time is nine hours to replace the starter motor and we think we can match it. I'm getting to the top bolt on the starter motor that you can just see here, which I've had to climb on top of the engine for. And then we're gonna support the engine with this big red engine brace, which will allow us to disconnect the subframe from the bottom of the engine, which we're doing now. Yeah. And once we've undone the bolts for the subframe, we can loosen off the engine mount and the engine mount bracket and it should just give us enough room to access the starter motor. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Big moment! Thank you. Thank you. Big moment! Hold <laughs> right, on, take a bow. So with the starter motor out, we wanted to be 100% sure that that was at fault. So Freddie got us a battery so we could put power directly to it. Yeah, there's a spot. But nothing. Yeah. So the starter was gone. That's good. <laughs> it looks like it may have burnt out when we tried to turn over a seized engine. And then Freddie wanted to test the solenoid on it to see if it was completely yeah. gone. Something it, that, it's, it's something, but it's, it's shorting. shorting out. That should be shooting out. It's shorting yeah. out. Yeah. Cool, everything's dead. You killed it, good. <laughs> $600 later, and we've managed to find a starter motor from an S6. Should be the same, but it does look slightly different, so we are slightly worried. You see this bit at the top? Little bit longer, little bit shorter. We think it's gonna work though. I can't see him making something so close and not being the one. I guess we'll find out when we fit it. Now we've got the horrible four more hours job of fitting this technically on the box. Let's get this fitted and please let it start. So we have a new starter motor. Yes, it is a reconditioned one. And yes, it's from an S6. But right now, we don't really have much choice. It looks pretty much identical, so I can't see why it wouldn't work. So now I'm squeezing it back into position, putting the engine mount bracket in place, then the engine mount, then using a little camera to tell my dad where to put his hand to screw the bolt in for the top of the starter. Then we can start bolting all the subframe back up to the chassis. Big moment number two. This time, it's gonna crank. Second time lucky, that's the saying. I'm just, I got all my, I gotta, hold on. There we go. All right, here we go. Where we going? Let's go. <laughs> 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 Got no leaks! What is that? Did you put oil in it? Oil was in it. Okay, good. Oil good. Was in oh. It. oh, it smells good. Oh, that's good. That's oh. good. So it seems an RS7 engine does work in an RS6, but does it? What's it saying? Got an EPC light. Why have we got EPC? The EPC light was throwing the car into limp mode, meaning that you can't rev it above 5,000 RPM. So I scanned the codes to find out why. Intake manifold control flaps are stuck open and closed. You know what it is, right? It's those little butterfly valves, yeah. like secondary butterfly valves. They look like throttle bodies, but they're not. They're so hard to get to. What? You're okay. telling me that something on this car is hard to get to. <laughs> <laughs> the car's in limp mode now because the intake manifold control valve is stuck open on one side and closed on the other. And guess what? They're on this. This is what they do. Open and they close the intake manifold thing. And it's on a little ball joint there. And that has just popped off on this one, which is saying to me on that engine, they're popped off. My most favorite thing about all of this is that they're so hard to get to. But the thing is, after a little bit of investigating and using that small camera again, I could see that the ball joint was on the actuator and these flaps are controlled with vacuum. 
So we sucked our own vacuum in and it still wouldn't open. After doing a bit of research, I had some bad news. The issue we're having is that these flaps here, which open on cold start, like this, are stuck. And they're stuck on the side where I pulled the inlet manifold off. And what we're supposed to do is when you push it back onto the engine, if you have a look down here, Matt, you can see these little butterfly flaps here. Now, if I push this on, the butterfly flaps interfere with these exhaust flaps like that. So what you have to do is push the inlet manifold on with them open. Otherwise, they hit against the, uh, the flaps here. And I haven't done that. So that's why it's stuck. That's why we think it's stuck. To get to this, to get to this, is very hard. <laughs> In very, the car. very hard. <laughs> yeah. Engine out. Engine out. Engine out. No engine I think out. it may have to come back out. Freddie was right. It did have to come back out because this was our access next to nothing. But as we've become experts at removing the engine, we got it out fairly fast. Let's hope this is the problem though. Once we got the engine out, I can start unbolting the inlet manifold and then pull it away from the engine. This is the reason why we're stuck. Because if you put it in like that, then they hit on these flaps here. So what we've got to do is push that down so it stays down, then put it in and then they bottom out on those flaps and that is the whole reason why we've had to take the engine out. I have never come across something like this before. Maybe it's just on the Audi engine, but it seems crazy that you have to do such a thing to put the inlet manifold back on. Now we need to make sure it actually works. The flaps should open and close and have full motion. So at the minute a vacuum is pulled, so they should be open. And what we're gonna do, take the vacuum off and we should hear it go you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. It did it. It worked. It did it. Yeah, that definitely worked. Oh my God. Okay, if that is the only thing, then this engine can go back in. We're putting this in and we are driving it in Florida. This time, for real. See you when this engine is back in. Right. Here we go. Please behave. The EPC light was still there and it was still in limp mode. And what's even worse than that? The same exact fault codes that we had before. Same codes. You know, I think if you take the engine out again, uh, I think that'll be. It comes in threes, right? <laughs> it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no. So the thing is, we can disconnect the vacuum and we can get both of them to get stuck closed. But then when we connect the vacuum, they both get stuck open. So the valves are actually working, but why are they saying they're stuck closed or stuck open? There's something not controlling them. It's gotta be a solenoid. The solenoid would control the vacuums going to the flaps. But after looking around the engine and testing everything, it all seemed to be okay. But then my dad had one last idea. There's one final thing, which my dad has just mentioned, which could be a possibility. The this is like a blocker offer of vacuum. And this is supposed to go into this part of the solenoid here. Now the solenoid allows the air to pass through it or stop passing through it. And this solenoid is in charge of letting the vacuum through to open and close the flaps. Problem is what my dad thinks, maybe he plugged the blocker offer on the bottom pipe here, so like he's got these two switched around. So essentially he'd be blocking off a vacuum on that side and then this one will be going there and it's essentially not 
it's not doing anything. Like these two are just switched the other way around. So it, we're gonna see what happens if we switch them around on there because he thinks he's got them the wrong way around. And we're gonna see what happens. This vacuum stuff, nightmare. We managed to get to the vacuum line and switch it over with the engine still in the car. I then got the Autel and cancelled all the old codes and went to start it again. Is it off? Is it off? <laughs> that was it! That was it! Yeah! And do you know whose side it was? My on side. your dad's side. <laughs> yeah. So we both made wrong, wrong things. But no EPC light and no limp mode. Yes. We have got an RS6 out of limp mode. All that was left to do now was bolt the whole thing back together and I could finally drive it on the Florida roads for the first time. The plan was, after putting it together, was just a clip straight to driving it on the road. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. What's happened? It won't start? No. It says start an engine and doesn't start. You joking? No. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> no. We don't need these jokes. I'm not joking, them. look, you ready? Oh. I'm gonna turn it off in case it burns the starter out. That is the starter though. Unless the battery's fat. I said to you. I took the charger off the battery. I said, don't celebrate. <laughs> Didn't the battery's flat? No. No, the no, battery's not, not flat. Not a chance that thing's rapidly going off. But that's not even making a noise on the starter. No. That's like it was when the starter had gone. Yeah, it was, yeah. That, start, that, that starter motor only lasted a few turns. What the <laughs> just took all the lining out and everything. I wanted to be a hundred percent sure that it wasn't the battery. So I put a jumper pack on it and then went to try again. But has the reconditioned starter motor gave up already? Well, it was running, wasn't it? <laughs> Literally running a minute ago before I put everything back together. What does it say? Starter. starter. No. I told you I'd start off. <laughs> no way. Are, are you joking? Are you joking? Starter does not turn, mechanically block or electric electrical malfunction. This would have been so good. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it as much as I did, please hit that thumbs up button. <laughs> please subscribe. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, see you in the next video. Peace out. We're all, we're all honestly, all in still disbelief. Uh, people are going to think we made that up. No, we ain't. <laughs> What's 20 to 3? 20 to 3 in the morning. We wouldn't. Where, are you, ble where are you bleeding? Where are you bleeding? Out <laughs> <Help> my eyes. <laughs> like a drug there.